you very much. All righty, Susan Quinn. I have a similar bad DNA poker hand to you and your family. Comes in handy occasionally, however. I was flying recently, and a woman sitting next to me, I ordered a Coke Zero. And she looked at my Coke can in disgust, and she said, you know, that artificial sweetener will kill you. So I said, well, let's think about this. We're in a metal tube, flying 500 miles an hour, 30,000 feet, violating the law of gravity, depending on the Bernoulli principle to keep us in the air. I said, I have had two aortic valve replacements, a double bypass, a heart attack, and three stents. I live with two mental illnesses, depression, major depression, and chronic suicidal ideation. So if sucralose is gonna kill me, it's gonna have to get in line. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's. Every now and then it pays to be a comedian. <laughs> I've done 12 TEDx talks and let me, let me, did you guys enjoy Ed yesterday, Ed Tate? Oh my God, that 30 minutes changed my life. My personal and my professional life. I was making notes and I, I contacted my marketing people immediately afterwards. Okay, we're getting three offers and a deadline. That is correct. Yeah, just an amazing, so I, um, so I have 12 TEDx talks. So let me do Ed. So what? Who cares? What's the rest? What's in it for me? Correct. I help aspiring speakers, authors, coaches, land a TEDx talk in 90 days, book $50,000 in speaking engagements in six months, guaranteed, or your money back, plus $5,000. Now, let me ask you three questions, as Ed would. Number one, are a TEDx, landing a TEDx, and making money speaking at the top of your bucket list? Number two, is making a living speaking and making a difference in the world near the top of your bucket list? And number three, are you willing to invest an hour a day and roughly a car payment a month, a Toyota car payment a month, not a Lexus car payment a month, to achieve those dreams? If you answered yes to all three, then we should be working together. If you answered no to any one of those, then we should not. Thank you, Ed Tate. <laughs> yes, I know, passion. My philosophy of speaking is, take your pain and turn it into passion, your passion into purpose, your purpose into profit. Now, six things you can do to kill your chances of landing a TEDx. Number one, selection committee members have told me, they, they call it the curation team at TEDx, that the number one thing that kills most TEDx applications is too much. Too many ideas. TEDx is one idea worth spreading. And I believe speaking should be one idea worth spreading. I believe, as Jane Atkinson says, you need to pick a lane. Be the expert so that when somebody comes looking for a speaker on your topic, they don't just want anybody, they want you. It's a long game, but I believe that is. There was a time in the 90s when I met Mark at the San Diego NSA where it, Meeting planners would hire somebody with six keynotes and pick one. Nowadays, I do believe that they want the expert. Um, so I, I think TEDx is a great way to begin that journey because they force you to select a or an idea worth spreading. Mine, as you might have guessed, is suicide prevention. And the elephant in the room, and I usually address this immediately when I keynote, is a comedian talking about depression, thoughts of suicide, how does that work? Well. It works for a couple of reasons. One, I, the world's first comedian was a court jester. Court jester's job was to speak truth to power on behalf of the powerless with humor. I believe I speak truth to the power of mental illness on behalf of those often powerless in its grip with humor. I believe where there's humor, there's hope. Where there's laughter, there's life that nobody truly dies laughing. And depression and suicide run in my family. My grandmother died by suicide, my mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her, I was four years old. I screamed for days. I'll spare you the details, it's horror movie horrible. But it's in my first TEDx talk called A Matter of Laugh or Death, L-A-U-G-H, A Matter of Laugh or Death. And if you are already hardwired for depression and thoughts of suicide, and you're that close to an actual suicide, the odds of you seriously considering taking your life later in life go up, and that's what happened. In April of 2010, in the last recession, after the speaking business dropped off 80% practically overnight, 
My wife and I lost everything in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And that's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Literally. I had a million dollar life insurance policy. I had a solution. My wife would be broken hearted, but she'd no longer be broke. In suicidality, there is something called burdensomeness. You believe you are a burden. The world would be better off without you. And my wife, I was worth more dead than alive. She would be better off financially without me. So I waited until she went to the grocery store. I went to the barn with my 38 caliber nickel plated Ruger. I pulled the hammer back, put the gun in my mouth. And for about 20 seconds, I thought about ending my life. And as Ed would say, 20 seconds of courage and a lifetime of confidence. Spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. It's okay to laugh, that was the point. <laughs> a friend of mine came up to me after a keynote recently, he goes, hey man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? <laughs> hey man, could you try to sound slightly less disappointed? <laughs> That's where the humor is in the target, by the way. So, A, or number one, idea that kills most TEDx applications too much. Number two is a cousin number one. Too much about one idea. They don't want a thesis or a dissertation. They want very brief descriptions on the application of your TEDx idea worth spreading. That's why they ask you, give it to us in three sentences. Give it to us in a video overview, 90 seconds. Give it to us in a 10 to 15 word elevator pitch. Pro tip, if they say 90 seconds, don't make it 91. They're looking for people who cannot follow directions. If I've got 200 applications to go through, I am not looking for the first reason to give you an audition. I'm looking for the first reason I can find not to. And if you give me 91 seconds in the video and I ask for 90 seconds, you can't follow directions, you're going in the no pile immediately. Uh, number three, not creative enough. Think about this, 200, 300 applications, 200, 300 applications on average for every TEDx. You have got to stand out. You have got to grab them by the lapels and not let go. You have to have a hook, some reason for them to keep reading. My fourth TEDx talk, and I did not have to audition. They liked the title, subtitle, and the idea so much, I did not have to audition. The title was Suicide, the Secret of My Success, which is counterintuitive, Dead Man Talking, which is a play on dead men walking in the book and the movie. The reason suicide was a secret of my success was, told my first joke in, uh, told my first joke in fourth grade, nine years old, kids laughed, teacher was hysterical. I thought to myself, I'm gonna be a comedian. Twelfth grade, there was a talent show. I was the first person ever to do stand-up. I won, of course I beat the accordion player and the international folk dancers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a victory is a victory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, Thanks to my high school girlfriend and my first wife, eventually, I buried that dream. Yes, my first wife, that was not her dream. No, her dream was we go to college, graduate, get good white collar jobs, get married, two kids, 2.5 kids, picket fence, dog, house, that was her dream. So I bought her dream and buried mine. Yep, eight years later, it almost buried me. My talk, my suicide secret of my success talk begins like this. What would you do, what uh, audacious thing would you attempt if you knew you had absolutely nothing to lose? What dream would you pursue if you knew by not pursuing it, you would literally die? That's where I was in January of 1984. I was married, she's a lovely woman, but we, d we didn't belong together and I was miserable. We had nothing in common. I, I, but you know what they say, opposites, Yep, she was pregnant, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> no, we never had any kids, I just love the joke. Um, I was selling insurance for her father's insurance company and that was what she wanted me to do and I was miserable. I was not pursuing comedy, which is what I knew I was born to do and I was miserable and I realized if I don't change all that very quickly, sooner rather than later, I'm gonna kill myself because I'm driving down Highway 163 in this town, five o'clock in the afternoon in January Dusk, it's drizzling, miserable, and for the first time in my life, I had that thought. I could just kill myself. My second thought was very empowering. Hold on. I could divorce my wife, quit my job, try comedy. If it works, great. If it doesn't, hell, I can always kill myself. 
Yeah. So that was the 20 seconds of confidence. I'm sorry. Yeah, 20 seconds of courage that led to 40 years speaking and doing stand-up comedy, confidence. And I like Ed. My wife doesn't say, humble, eh? But a lot of things very similar. <laughs> yes, because I am not humble. I, I, have a, I, have, I have what I call reverse imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Imposter syndrome means that you look good on paper, but you look really good on paper, but you're not. And somebody's going to figure that out and expose you. In my case, I, I look better than I am on paper. I mean, I, I'm better than I look on paper. And I just want somebody to figure that out. <laughs> my personal mantra is, often wrong, never in doubt. <laughs> yeah. No. As my mother would say, it's not arrogance if you can back it up. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, can't. So, uh, too, many, too much about one idea. Make sure that you give them no more than they ask for because they've got 200 applications to go through, 300 applications, yeah, and grab them by. I've had two cases in my TEDx career where I did not have to audition. That one I did not have to audition for, and my personal favorite that I did not have to audition for, the title was Mental Health and the Orgasm, Treat Your Depression Single-Handedly. <laughs> and my pitch was, I love my iPhone, but it's my second favorite handheld device. And they called me and said, no, you're not auditioning. You're going to come over here and do that. <laughs> and I got a standing ovation. And, and it was on a joke that my wife said, don't do that. I said, it's going to kill. Because <laughs> I'm talking about self-pleasure and orgasm and so forth. And at the end, I said to them, do you guys know why they call an orgasm an orgasm? And they're looking at me like, no. I said, because nobody can spell. <laughs> <laughs> standing ovation. That told me that creativity was the key, the first hurdle to get over. By the way, for me, the second hurdle was, I'd been a comic for two and a half decades. Who's going to take me seriously? So, because somebody asked me, one of my clients asked me the other day, did you have a TEDx on your bucket list? No. I did not know what a TEDx was. I was lamenting to my wife that nobody's going to take me serious, and she goes, do a TEDx. And I said, what's a TEDx? Just by chance, I got an application that week in the email from one in Vancouver, British Columbia, filled it out, got it. And that proved to the world, meeting planners, speakers bureaus, that I could do something serious with humor. Proved to the audience in Vancouver. My first joke was, yeah, I did a little research on suicide. Just see how other people who did TEDx handled the topic. I went to TED.com looking for those TEDx's on suicide, figuring there'd be two, three dozen. No, there were three. Only three talks out of hundreds of thousands. And then I said to the audience, then it hit me. Well, duh. If you're really good at suicide, you're not going to be recording a TEDx talk. <laughs> yeah. So. Fourth, twelfth grade. Yep, buried my dream, buried me. Yep. Um, let's see. Mental health and the orgasm. Yes. Uh, I apologize because I took notes from Ed yesterday. I had to bring my notes up with me. Uh, let's see. So one is too much, too many ideas. Two is too much about one idea. Three is not creative enough. I believe that's the first hurdle. It's, you know, it's not really an application for TEDx. It's a marketing pitch to the selection committee. I've got a client who wrote a book called, he's in AA, he's been in AA about 20 years. It was called Sober Letters to My Drunken Self. Boom. Within two weeks, he had a TEDx. So I think that's the first hurdle. Four. Picking the wrong coach. I'm not saying you have to hire me to coach you, but pick somebody who is creative. I have a friend named Amy. Amy called me, we're chatting away. She goes, what? You're coaching TEDx? Oh, I wish I'd known two weeks ago. I just signed up with Thought Leader. Now, Thought Leader's a good company. Good company. They put a lot of people on stage. I, she got, I said, Amy, they're a good company. They'll, you know, they'll do right by you. A couple of months later, she called me. I said, what's up, Amy? She started crying. I said, why are you crying? She goes, I've applied 80 times. 80, 8 zero. No audition. I said, well, it's a good topic. I know that. You have a book on Amazon. It's a bestseller. I mean, a genuine bestseller on Amazon in a difficult category on the topic. Would you mind sending me what you're sending them? She sent it to me. I looked it over. I's dotted, T's crossed. Grammar's good. Just didn't sing. 
no reason to keep reading. So I called her back, Amy, could I put a little of my crazy creative on this? She goes, yeah. So I did. She submitted five times, got TEDx Beacon Street, Boston. Yeah, which again told me that it's creativity. If, you're gonna, if they're going through that many applications, it's got to have a hook. It's got to be creative. It's got to grab them and make them want to read on so you can get the audition. So that's number four. Uh, number five, passion. It's hard to be inspiring if you're not inspired. There's a great book, make a note, it'll be on the test, called Talk Like Ted. Talk Like Ted. He watched hundreds of TED Talks, TED TEDx Talks. Boiled it down to nine things he believes are in every great TED or TEDx. Number one is passion. You gotta be passionate about the topic. You guys think I'm passionate about suicide prevention? Yes. It is, it, people, people ask me, how'd you pick suicide as a topic? Well, you know, tell you the truth, it picked me. It's in my DNA, literally in my DNA. It's one of the things that keeps me alive. I feel like George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. Because people, after I get done talking, speaking, we do general Q&A and then I say, look, if you've got a question you want to ask, story you want to tell, don't want to tell everybody, I'll, I'll hang out 30, 45 minutes. And people line up, sometimes two people, sometimes 10. And I mean, um, the, had a guy in, in Cincinnati, at a, on site, at a construction site, nice black man, young, middle 20s I'm thinking, came up to me crying so hard he couldn't speak. So I waited till he could gather himself. I said, what's up? He goes, I work on the fifth floor. I think about jumping off every day. I haven't slept in two nights. I said, well, why is that? He goes, I've lost three people close to me in the last year to violence, including my daughter who died in my arms. I, I, I waved the HR guy over who hired me and I said, you need to go grab the EAP, Employee Assistance Program Binder, and take this young man by the hand and get him to a mental health facility, the closest one, immediately because he's circling the drain. A couple of months later, had reason to talk to that HR guy again. I'm terrified to ask. Finally got up my, my nerve. What happened to that nice young African-American man? Frank, he was evaluated. He was medicated, he's back on the job. That's why suicide prevention, that's why I'm passionate about suicide prevention. Let's see, wrong coach, passion. Oh, and something very mechanical, numbers. Some of my clients that I have now said to me, yeah, I applied a couple times, three, four times around here, never heard back, gave up. It's a bit of a numbers game. There are 200 plus TEDx talks in the US, 3,000 worldwide. And I tell my clients, we need to apply everywhere and anywhere. People ask me, of your clients, who gets a TEDx? Well, clients who I see several times a month, two, three times a month, and who fill out three to six applications a month, 100% of them have a TEDx, some have two, some have three. So it's a matter of numbers. You just have to keep applying and applying and applying. And, and uh, my talk on mental health and the orgasm, I applied 15 times before I landed the 16th. I knew it was so far out there that, that most TEDx committees would just dismiss it out of hand. Pardon the pun. And, <laughs> but if somebody liked it, they would love it. And they did. I mean, it was, and we had a ball. And there was scientific evidence in there. There's a, a study that men who self-pleasure 21 times a month or more have a 20% lower rate of prostate cancer. So I said to the audience, 21 times a month, if that is the threshold to prevent prostate cancer, at this moment in time, I am immortal. My name is Frank King, thanks very much.